Welcome to the Alice in Wonderland podcast. So this is a place for you to let your sense of wonder, imagination, and most importantly, your curiosity loose. So I'm Georgia Alice, and today I'm joined by the founder and owner of The Brain Room, Rob Von Beck. So Rob, a little bit about Rob, I'm not going to go too much into what Rob does because I'm, I'm pretty certain we'll get into that as we go along. So Rob is an applied neuroscientist practitioner who works with professionals and athletes and he shows them how to attain higher levels of cognitive and emotional intelligence and function. So let's get curious. Hey, welcome Rob. Thanks, Georgia. I love um, I love the the blue chip uh, mindset um, mentality. It's um, yeah, it's really cool. Thank you, and it's really awesome to have you here. And um, I'm really keen to get curious and to go down a, a couple of rabbit holes with you in in relation to the work that you do. Uh, but yeah. before we do, I have a question that I ask everybody who jumps on my podcast, and it's the same question right. to everyone. And I want you to imagine that I'm a seven-year-old girl and I'm skipping my way through Wonderland where there's all these magical people and places and experiences and it's just really novel. And I bump into Rob. Rob's sitting there smoking his pipe on a mushroom because that's what happens in real Alice in Wonderland, if you've seen the movie. Smoking some mushrooms, anyway. Yep. <laughs> so he's sitting on his sitting on the mushroom, and um, I say, "Hey, Rob, Mr. Grombeck, what do you do? Mm. How would you answer that to a seven-year-old girl?" Mm. Uh, we play games. Um, I play games with people to help their brains work better. Nice, succinct answer. That's probably one of the most succinct answers I've had. I love it. So you really know what you do. It's taken me a long time to get there and that clarity probably only came up in the last week, Georgia. Yep. So full, 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 full clarity, full, dis full disclosure. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. So, so talk to us a little bit about how you do that. So why, why games? Why the brain? How did you land here? How did you land in you know, creating the brain room? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it started with the Big Bang. Um, no, just kidding. Um, we don't want to go that far back. Right? <laughs> um, it's interesting. Um, recently, um, completing um, some training um, with the Flow Genome Project, which you've, you've, you've taken training with, and um, it's been fascinating to look back and where were the times in my life where I was experiencing states of, of joy and, and engagement and timelessness and selflessness where I just got wrapped up in what I was doing um, and, there, and possibly uh, um, we were in a small group and um, I was thinking back and back and back and it was like I think it started with board games with the family you know Monopoly, Holiday, Snakes and Ladders, Mahjong, just fun games um, that you play that we played with our family so that, that's what I did um, and then early memories and recollections of, um, of playing cricket in the backyard um, um, during during Christmas with my uncle or my auntie and my my, my grandparents, um, and she's showing up to playing football practice in Melbourne um, in Bundura. Um, I, I I live in Far North Queensland on the top end of, um, of Australia, but I used to live in the southeast corner in in Melbourne, and having a pie after training. Um, and then getting into computer games as a kid and playing Donkey Kong and Pac-Man, these little handheld things that were just LED um, shadows on a screen and then moving on to Atari with the little stick and the one button and then Nintendo um, with the two buttons and the D-pad and then kind of progressing on, um, kind of went away from the board game, but just some, for some reason there's been a, um, a level of play um, with uh, and playing games 
Um, and I really dived deep into computer games in my teenage years. Um, and as well as sports. So I think games has always been a way for me to have fun and, and be challenged and, and play with people and tease people. And, and it's, just, it's just a fun thing. I, I, I enjoy games. Um, and also I enjoy the coaching of, um, of games. So I think that's kind of where I got started, I think. And, how and, I ended up here. and so you've got this this childhood and this t these teenage years of playing mm. games, which is awesome. But now you're mm. teaching games with more of a purpose around, yeah. as we, as you you know, as I said in the intro, around this you know higher cognitive abilities and better function and increasing intelligence. Mm. So where where did you discover and how or how did you discover or what is it that bridges the gap around playing games for fun and then playing games for a purpose even though it's still going to be fun but having a purpose yeah, yeah. behind it so where what happened there yeah um for, for, for me i'd probably skip a decade which was a decade of um of working in various jobs and security and hospitality and um and um, social welfare, welfare and things like that um so from, from high school, I basically had a gap decade. Some people have a gap year where they take a year off and then study. Well, I took a gap decade. Uh, came back and studied um, social science, um, psychology and um, social work um, and started in 2011. Um, graduated 2000, sorry, 2007. Graduated in 2011 and uh, including a, a year trip exchange to, to Maastricht to study neuroscience um, and cognitive neuroscience over in, um, in, in the Netherlands which was a wonderful experience. Um, and, um, and so I was able to understand psychology and understand somewhat about the brain and the importance of having research. Um, so maybe a research study has done, been done where 700 people played board games and 700 people didn't and they looked at happiness or fun or engagement or whatever. And they found that after playing board games for um, six months, this group was happier than the other group or whatever. So it really taught me the value of looking at, um, at peer-reviewed research, as fallible as it can be, because um, if you just happen to pick a, a bunch of people who love board games and love socialising and you put them in the treatment group, well, they're going to love it. It's not really the board games, it was just the socialisation that they loved. Mm -hmm. so, um, um, so research is, is tricky because you can't always isolate variables. Um, so what's the research? Um, is, is um, that the back something up. And that's important to me now. It's much more important than it was um, just playing for fun. So what's something that's fun, uh, is engaging, um, challenges me, um, which if I do it enough times, will actually create a, um, a, new, a new strength, a new neural circuit, a new neural pathway, or an enhanced neural pathway that might enhance my ability to stay focused while I'm at school or while I'm playing sports or my ability to, when stress kicks in, um, a neural circuitry pathway kicks in, which calms me down and slows my breathing. So if there's a pathway for something, we can train it. I'm really jumping forward now, but if there's a pathway for focus, we can train it. And if there's a pathway for relaxation or I'm staying calm under pressure, we can train it. Um, and it's, and um, I guess the big thing, I guess one of the big things for me was understanding growth mindset as different to optimism or pessimism. I've always learned about optimism and pessimism. Um, learned helplessness, where nothing I do will work and you give up, versus, oh, no, it's okay, I'll try again tomorrow. But mindset was more about how do you see your ability, is it fixed or is it, or is it malleable? And when I think a lot of people will have fixed mindsets about their intelligence or their emotionality or their focus because they've never been shown that there's a way to... Um, enhance your focus or um, become more calm. They just think it's about talking to yourself and rah-rah sessions and motivational speaking. So um, I think um, I think I've really kind of opened up about seven different um, rabbit holes. You have, um, and I'm trying to work out which one I'm going to go down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so I think it, it came out, because I think it's come full circle because I'm realizing that I love to be engaged with computer games. And for example, if there's a, um, an, uh, a computer game or an app, it's just a computer game, right? And I can put it onto my, onto my head. So I've got, say, this, um, this, bio, this um, neurofeedback device called Focus Band. 
and it's got sensors on it. I'm just showing it for those in audio. For, the, for those that are, yes, but those that are um, in yep. audio, you can't see this. You might want to jump onto the video, but yeah. Yeah, it, it's a Karate Kid type headband. It has sensors on it, which can pick up certain levels of brain waves on my, um, that are coming through my frontal lobe, which is very much our focusing, our attentioning, our decision making, somewhat part of our most human parts of our of our brain, as well as the you know, the cow brain and the and the and, and the um, the dog brain and the lizard brain and all the other different brains we have. So if if the game is to make something on the screen jump by relaxing myself, I'm kind of, I'm going to be into that because I've been into games. I'm 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 used to playing that. So it just happens that I'm someone who wants. To improve and 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 be better and have a, and just have a better a better life um, a better ability not 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 be such an idiot sometimes yeah um, but I can but there are tools out there where I can actually play computer games I control the computer game with my brain and by doing that I can actually start to lay down new pathways that's, yeah I love that me, so so that's the is ultimate jam. So this is this is basically what the brain room is, right? So how about let's just go I just want to go back yeah. a little bit to the brain room so people can get and you can leave you can leave your focus band on because it looks pretty cool. Um I should turn it on. <laughs> so let's go back to the brain room so people can understand yeah. well, what what is this brain room. So can you just elaborate a little bit on what what it is and why would people rock up to your business the brain room? Yeah, thank you, Georgia. Um, the brain room is just like a, 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 tr a training center for the body. Um, so it's, it's a gym or a personal training studio for the brain. Um, just like we can do squats for our legs, there's certain exercise that you will do to work a certain body part. Or you'll do boxing to raise up your heart rate and get your lungs and cardiovascular fitness to be healthy, as well as being able to you know, get better shoulders and arms. And stuff. Yeah. Um, the brain has different parts. It's like we have body parts that do certain functions like push, pull, stand, what punch. And um, we have certain brain areas which perform different tasks at a general level. And we know that there are various tasks or exercises that when we do, we actually recruit mainly those parts of the brain. Just like squats mainly use the legs. Although you use your arms and your shoulders and everything, but mainly you use your legs. So, um, there's, so there's a variety of games and exercises which I've done my best to collate and bring into the, the, the brain room, just like they've got the best squat rack or the best treadmill or whatever. And they put it in a place where people can come and actually have tailored programs to enhance their fitness or their strengths or, or whatever. So the brain room is a place where you can train various um, lobes, lobes of your brain, which generally correlate, are generally active when we're doing certain cognitive tasks like focusing or decision making or being mindful um, or um, relaxing ourselves. And um, if we can, if we train, if we do those exercises, we're going to get better. Our brain's actually going to get better and, and focus longer and it's going to kick into a relaxation mode or be more likely to be mindful if we practice it. Just like if yeah. you practice your forehand at tennis, 10,000 times when it's time to finally do that forehand, it's going to come out without thinking. Yeah. But to expect that you're going to be calm and composed and focused under pressure when you haven't trained yourself to be calm and focused under pressure is hoping. And that's the hope mentality, which I think is rife in all performance. We hope we're going to fall into flow. We hope we're going to show up happy or um, creative. Like, let's get rid of hope. Let's add, let's go from hope, which might be 50 50, to maybe 80% I'm going to, I'm going to show up today. Yeah. And so I'm really trying to remove that, 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 that hope mentality by creating um, real exercises. Um, and of course, layering on top of that, the growth mindset that if you, that you can improve your focus, you can improve your mindfulness. And the beautiful thing about all this technology, and this is where games and technology come in, is that they can often measure better than we can as humans, how we're going on the path. Yeah, because we put our overlay of our own perceptions on things and we, we sort of rate something subjectively, but this is really objective. It's saying, no, this is, this is what's happening. This yeah. is feedback, the neurofeedback we're getting. And I just want to yeah. make a point there on what you're saying just for our listeners as well, that there's a, 
a, a, a neuroscience law called the law of repetition. And I talk about this quite a lot, the law of repetition and the power of repetition. So repetition is what I call the mother of all learning and um, I guess the father of change, right? So Whoa. if you if you want to learn something, for instance, you if you repeat it, you're strengthening those neural networks like what you're saying. So for someone to come to the, the brain room gym and they want to strengthen, let's say, their memory, there would be a game or something that they could do that would help them um, strengthen that, their ability to remember things, correct? Is that, there's, yeah, there's games like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Memory is, um, is, 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 is definitely um, up there. Um, I train more working memory, but yeah. Yeah, so memory, let's just we'll yep. use memory yep. as an example. So yep. if, I, if I believe that I don't have a very good memory, which is wrong, it just means you have a weak memory unless you've had some, Thank you. yep. yeah, some form of brain injury. Um, you've got a weak memory. You've just got to strengthen it. So you've got to go to the gym and you've got to work out your memory muscle. And the law of repetition says the more you practice a skill, a thought, um, mm. a an emotion or a feeling the more you do yep. pardon a movement or yep. a movement yeah the more yep. you practice that through repetition over and over and over again that whatever it is you're practicing becomes innate it becomes second nature it becomes subconscious it becomes automatic so when you're talking before around okay um, I want to be more calm under pressure well you can't just hope that tomorrow I'm going to walk into a meeting because I've decided today I'm going to be calm under pressure when you don't have a strong muscle for calm under pressure. Mm. So you actually have to go and do the work. You, you have to strengthen that. And what I love about the brain room is you've got the facilities there to do it. Like people can just turn up and you can help them with their focus. You can help them with their mindfulness. You can, you can strengthen those neural networks that are going to become over time second nature. So instead of hoping I'm going to turn up and be calm at work, you're going to have a lot of faith, not hope that you will because it's now part of who, who you are. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, faith. Yeah, yeah. Because so you've done the work, and and faith is confidence, and yeah. confidence isn't false. I can do it. I can do it. It's I've done it a thousand times at practice, but that's real confidence. It's yeah. fake false confidence where you're trying to tell yourself something that I can do something even though I've never done it. I mean that be, that might be crucial sometimes where you need to persist and keep on trying. But if it's I need to get this right and I've got one chance for it, hoping and not training is a poor strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And I think confidence can come with the knowledge and knowing that if I repeat this, I will get better at it. So that then gives you faith that, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to use a bit of willpower to be calm, but I still need to, I still need to strengthen that mental muscle. Um, so I, I love everything you do. One of the programs that I take people through, we actually talk about mental muscles and everyone goes, well, how do I strengthen them? I go, just go to Google. Like, I don't teach people that. It's almost like I need a brain room for my clients to go to so they can, because we talk about six mental muscles and I'm not sure mm -hmm. if the brain room will cover all of these. So we talk about, okay. we talk about reasoning, which is your ability to think. So just thinking better instead of just letting the, the, the churn of yesterday's thoughts just pop up today. That's not thinking. That's just, you know, running a program. Uh, so we talk about reason, we talk about uh, will or focus, your ability to concentrate. So that, you know, your ability to concentrate is how people achieve things in life. So we need to strengthen that muscle, right? We, we also talk about memory. So memory being a, a mental muscle that you can strengthen. Um, we talk about imagination. So that's a mental muscle being creative. Like how do we become more creative and innovative in our life and uh, with the world around us? And the last one is intuition. So not all of those are going to fit into the brain room, but the calmness and all those other things, they can be piled in there because I think they live, they move to a more uh, fulfilled and extraordinary life when you are actually using your body to its fullest, fullest capacity. And a lot of us don't, right? Yeah, yeah. I think what I think what comes up for me as, as you're saying that is, um, if you are if you're working your body and you are doing boxing, you might not be doing squats, but your legs are kind of gonna get, your legs will get a little bit more stamina because of that. Um, so there'll be flow on effects um, 
in the same way that if you train yourself to be more calm uh, as, a, as a general baseline. Um, and we can use measures. We can put a finger sensor and then it'll see what your skin um, temperature is or what your sweat response is. And that's psychophysiology. That's looking at how is my emotion um, mirrored or um, given away um, by what's happening at the skin level and, and, and the blood. And am I, am I stressed and is the blood leaving my hand? Or am I nice and relaxed and in this rejuvenated state and there's beautiful blood flowing out to my hands and um, obviously just think of cold and clammy hands or cold feet. It's someone who's panicked and there's, and, and there's real truth to that. So if you can change your baseline when you're more often in that relaxed state. Stress, stress is the enemy, chronic stress is the enemy of the brain. So we need to work hard and focus, but we also need to balance it with rest and recovery. So some people don't actually know how to down-regulate their nervous system. They don't know how to switch off, if that, for lack of, lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. or they don't know how to go into recharge mode. And like, sw switching off is one thing because you can watch the telly, but you're not really switching off. You might be watching something that's really, really um, stressful and it's very, oh, it's thrilling and I'm going to watch the next episode, the next episode. So I think the skills of switching on and being focused is, is really important. And some people get way too distracted and are maybe too, too lax and need that. So some people will need that. Um, and those with attention deficit or, um, or um, ability, um, keep on um, their mental stamina decreases. Um, focus training would be good for that. Uh, where someone that is focused, but they constantly get angry or they get angry and they can't come down. So for the next day, they're still up. Or for the next week or for the next three hours, they're still in a terrible, they're, they're still affected physiologically. Their heart rate is still up. They've still got hormones flushing through their body, stress hormones. Three hours later after something that happened in the car on the way to work, mm -hmm. you've just been made incompetent um, inadequate, um, impotent because of something that happened in the in, in traffic on the way to work. Now your ability to bounce back from stress as hell and angry as hell and straight back down to where you were within five minutes, that's a, that's a crucial skill. And I don't think enough people have, people are, they may not have the faith in it because they've probably never been put in a situation where they've been forced to made really angry or really stressed or really overwhelmed and then and then been, um, been given the task of bringing yourself back down to the baseline. Yeah. And that's my job. Like doing, mm -hmm. doing stress management in a workshop is bullshit. You want to do stress management or stress regulation, self-regulation, make someone stress, make them overwhelmed, make them um, get frustrated, and then practice self-regulation techniques. Yeah. Because I then you're actually resisting against something. You're actually steering away from something. Whereas if you're relaxed and happy, I can, I can, can self-regulate. Well, you don't need this self-regulation when you're, when you're relaxed and happy and well-rested. You need it when you've just been pissed off and you're frustrated and you're about to blow your top. So my, really, I, part of my job is to provoke people, not in a negative way, but provoke them and frustrate them. And then once they're in that stage, like, okay, practice your self-regulation techniques, such as breathing or putting on the, the band and slowing your brain waves down. Um, otherwise, you're lifting weight with a broomstick. Yeah. I love, no I love that we've got technology that can actually support us in this as well. And the, what you're talking about is our, our refractory period. So the time it yeah. takes from an event to us being able to come back to homeostasis and, and not have That's that event charge us right so you know what i find really fascinating is that our body can have a stress response just by imagining something so we can we can sit here and remember something from the past so let's say you know you and i knew each other and you really annoyed me 10 years ago and i haven't gotten over it and just the thought of that puts me in high stress so my refractory period let's say that happened 10 years ago my refractory period is 10 years. I still haven't come down from that. I'm still carrying that, isn't it? So how do I then, how do I then be able to get to a point where I can think about that event and not have an emotional charge, not have the stress response? And that's can what I you're saying. You can I give you a case study on that? Yeah, oh, like yes, it. please. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I had a client come to me um, 
it's actually a colleague from, from uni and she was, um, and she's saying she's going through a lot of stress. Uh, so I've hooked her up to some uh, a biofeedback sensor. We put it on her finger, kind of like the thing you would put onto your finger for um, for oxygen when you're in hospital. But this is, again, it's picking up sweat, picking up um, blood flow, which are indications of are you stressed or are you relaxed. And, um, and uh, it's also picking up her heart rhythm. Um, and I had her breathe in a certain way. Um, some people call it bagel breathing. Um, some people call it resonant frequency breathing. Essentially, it's breathe in for four seconds, hold for one, breathe out for six, and hold for one. So a 12-second breath cycle. Um, you're, you're, we're, we're making the exhale dominant. Um, so the exhale is longer than the inhale. So five breaths per minute. Basic, basic, basic um, mechanical breath mechanics, right? As she does that, we see her finger temperature increases. We see her skin conductance drop, and we see the, her heartbeat get into a beautiful rhythm where as she breathes in, it goes up, and as it breathes in, it goes down. So it looks like a beautiful sine wave, high peaks and high troughs, a really harmonic, coherent heartbeat. So she's in this beautiful rest and digest mode. And I can see it, and she's going, yeah, I'm feeling so good. There was uh, um, uh, uh, one of her boyfriend's best friends or friends, shit her to tears. Like, just the mere mention just, she had a visceral response to him. And what we did, it was horrible at first, is I found an image of him on the internet from Facebook. And I get goosebumps thinking about it right now. I'm looking down and I'm getting my goosebumps. And as she was doing that task, she's raised herself from normal state to really relax, feeling good, and I bring up this guy's face on the screen. And boom, the heart rhythms go to crap and erratic, the skin temperature um, drops, um, skin conductance, which is sweat, um, increases. So she goes into a panic mode just by showing his face. And then I'm like, okay, that's enough. I took it away after about five seconds. And her refractory period, it took her uh, it's maybe five or, five or 10 minutes at first to get herself back to that even keel. Um, and I could see it was an even keel because I'd used the, the psychophysiology, the, the skin uh, measurement. Um, and the blood flow to see what what was going on for her central nervous system. And um, we did it again. She dropped less. And then she came back to baseline sooner. I think we did one more session um, where it affected her a little bit. The third session, she breathed through the whole thing. And I even made it. Now, those, those of you that um, are listening, um, um, I'll describe it. But... First, it was a small image on a very large projector screen, and then I used the mouse scroll button to make it really big, and then make it really small. Like I made it like so it gets like pull up the massive part of the screen and kept on kind of making it small and big, small and big, small and big, like really making it really big and just trying to get it focused. Even zeroing on on his nose or his face or his mouth or just really trying to really affect her somehow. Um, and her psychophysiology didn't budge, and she was yeah. done. Like she was done with him. And apparently he showed up in her life three times out of the blue and she was friendly to him and she didn't have her initial response and he's disappeared from their life. Yeah. But it may seem that he was just a little shit that liked to get a rise out of her and he didn't get the rise anymore, didn't get the novelty and the fun and pissed off and found someone else to torture. Yeah. And, and I love that. Because, in her life. Yeah. You, you, you got me thinking there around like, you know, sometimes we think, yeah, yeah, I'm over that ex-husband, that ex-wife. I'm over that yeah. person who did whatever it was to me and annoyed me 10 years ago. Yeah. But if Brilliant. we have the biofeedback and we show you a photo, let's see what's really going on in your body. And mm. what is your, because if you're not over it, if you can't stay calm with that picture or that response, you, your refractory period is, could be, it's still 10 years. That's still at a level affecting you. Yeah. And that's the baggage we carry through life. And when I say baggage, it's, uh, it's something heavy we're carrying on our nervous system that then doesn't, yeah. doesn't help us. It's, doesn't, it's, it's not worth it. So I love that there's the ability of being able to move through those things as well in the brain room. So, yeah, you've, you're training so many different elements for people to have a, a more fulfilling and awesome life, right? Imagine, you know, not yeah. having these, these are, these are, um, responses or reactions, I should say, reactions. Yeah, like visceral, 
like yeah. like grinding her teeth, like shoulders hunching, like gut wrenching, like oh, it just frustrates me so much. Yeah, Ooh, meh, the meh. Yeah, the, whatever. Yeah, and that wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. We need one of these in every workplace, right? So imagine, you know, the colleague, the boss, the whatever it is. Um, wouldn't it be nice to be able to sit there and go, yeah, yeah, no, they don't, they don't, they don't bother me. Well, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> Let's just check and that. It's like a lie detector. It is, and and I think for for the people um, who are listening, regardless of the biofeedback. I, um, I just noticed that when I went in to check if there were people in, in my mind, like, okay, who, who can I think about um, to see if I can, I, it was a gut check. And I noticed my stomach tightened and my breathing changed. And that in itself, your diaphragm and your breath is your own real time breath biofeedback. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it. That is it. Like forget these high tech fancy sensors. You've already got your own sense inside of you. Um, yes, I love the fancy sensors. I dig it. Uh, but for those who are like, well, 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 don't put a wall up, you know, give me something now. Um, the ability to think of someone and maintain your breath. Um, one, one of our mentors, Jamie Wheel, um, discussed, uh, he was uh, um, disgust with an SS, disgust, not disgust. <laughs> um, Disgusting. He, um, quote, exactly. Disgusting. He, um, he quoted um, um, one of the yogis and the, the yoga tradition. Um, and it was one of, in one of his breathing um, um, respiration uh, webinars. He talked about if you you are you are invincible if no one can change your breath. Mm. So if you can go through the worst hell, but your breath stays intact, as in the rhythm and the pace and the deepness and the resonance of your breathing, and if it doesn't whimper or wig out or clench, you you kind of got your shit sorted. Yeah, so it's almost like this is your your inter your breath is your tuning fork. Yeah, it, it can sort of tune you if if you concentrate and if you pay attention to your body. And a lot of us don't. A lot of us don't pay attention. We pay more. We give more attention to our thoughts, and our yeah. thoughts are going to be impacted by our perceptions and the lens we see the world through. But how you're feeling at a visceral level, if you can just pay attention to your breathing and how you're breathing, I think you're going to get some automatic feedback on whether this Absolutely. situation, this person, this movie, whatever it is, how's that affecting me? Yeah. And then you can sense when I'm with that person, I don't hold my breath anymore. Yeah. Or when I'm with that person, I don't get tight. Um, for, for many years, I would get into, and, and I think I probably still do a little bit, if there was someone that was like an authority figure, um, I would go up to them and I would be shaking and I could hardly get a word out. Like, what the hell's going on there? I just want to talk to these people. Um, but there's something inside of me that has this fear and I'm, I'm trembling and, and I can't get my words out and I come across as some lunatic. And that's definitely not the way I, I want to be. Um, I think there's a lot. I think I can definitely improve um, in, in that regard. Um, myself, you know, there's a ton of people that I could go back, even just this one process and go, okay, we're going to do an inventory every month. We're going to focus, we're going to bring someone up in my life that I've had issues with. And I'm going to um, find what my baseline is um, with this um, sensor. So back to the sensor, if I was to do it, I'd find out what, what's my current baseline. Okay, find an image of them, um, put myself into a really good relaxation state, and then bring that person maybe to mind because our, our imagination is probably a better VR than any VR or any image on the screen, but sometimes you can control images better than you can your own, your own mind. So put an image up on the screen and see what happens to the sensor. See if your mm -hmm. scores drop and see how long it takes you to rebound and then work to decrease that uh, refractory period, like you said, from, from minutes to moments um, to not even a blip. And when you can do that two or three times, just the mere thought of that person no longer makes your heart jump. Yeah. No longer makes your stomach or your skin crawl. These are amazing the words that we use um, to describe how we feel about things. Um, it really gets on my nerves. I mean, literally, these are people that the mere sound of their voice or the mere um, sight or smell of that, that, that aroma brings up all sorts of issues. And I guess really what we're getting down to now is triggers and post-traumatic stress disorder. 
yeah. and, and, and how certain sounds or smells or, or images can create traumatic uh, flashbacks, um, which is yeah, pretty full on. So, yeah, but I, yeah, I, think, we down, yeah, sorry. But I think it's really, it's really incredible how people who maybe don't understand this, we, we have the ability to be able to create that sense of calmness, homeostasis um, mm. on our own. Like we can do that, but we have to practice it. So the client you had, yeah. she now has a, a muscle mm. for calmness. She knows how to do that. And automatically, whether it's that particular person from the past or mm. whether it's she's now in a situation and it's, live and somebody is really annoying her that muscle is there and she can use it mm. so yeah. if she can actually go oh oh i'm feeling that i'm you know gritting my teeth and i'm holding my breath i don't like this yeah. person breathe mm. so she knows how to breathe and then the muscle is automatic yeah. and oh god the world would be a better place if everyone knew this stuff <laughs> just Amen. saying Amen. <laughs> Because you see so many people walking yeah. around with their shoulders as earrings, holding their breath, not breathing, um, mm -hmm. and allowing, allowing things and people and circumstances to dictate what's going on within themselves, their thoughts, but most importantly, their, their mm -hmm. body. And yeah. their body is going to store that until they learn to let it go, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Georgie. Well, look, I love, I love everything you put just then. And I think one thing to hopefully you know, put, the nail, put the nail in it for people, uh, even though it's a broader, to build a broader context, is the, the concept of, um, of sharpening the saw from Stephen Covey and the habits of effective people. And we're jumping all of the private fixed habits and the public habits. But the, the foundational habit is sharpening the saw. And if you're a tool, I'm a tool, I can be a bit of a tool. But if, if we are instruments, um, we need to be tuned, we need to be sharpened, we need to be maintained. And if not, um, if we don't constantly get into a repair, recover, rejuvenate mode, we become blunt and we become ineffective um, and we become wasteful in our energy because we're putting an absolute amount of energy into what we're doing, but we are, empty vessel we've got no power in the drill where in so these these, these these breath practices for example um to use to um to get ourselves into a rest and digest mode there's a bit of um banging and crashing and drilling can you hear any of that a little a little bit yeah. but it's yeah, yeah. just our listeners if you're hearing that noise um it's just something going on in the background but that's yeah, yeah, yeah. your voice is your, your voice is way suaver than yeah. the, we can hear it's it just my mind turning over um the cogs the, um, are churning exactly it's really um, appropriate though you are talking about tools exactly yeah wow i love that good catch um <laughs> if we're constantly in a chronic sympathetic or stress mode well then eventually our sleep will get worse our um our memory will get worse our ability to pay attention will get worse and it will compound over weeks and months and years to the point where we'll we will be um it, it's like overtraining the body. Like if you don't give your body a your body a break, eventually it's going to deteriorate, um, snap, strain. Um, something's going to get tendonitis. Um, the brain is, is in, in, in the central nervous system. Is really our brain is the central auto autonomic nervous system, with the body being the peripheral um, nervous system. If the brain is allowed to get into rest and digest mode. It's the most insane thing that you could ever do as a human being um, to not. Um, so let's let's. I want to I want to go a bit deep here. So yeah. because I see it in Sorry, this. Day, it, yeah. No, it's okay. In this day and age, mm. we are so distracted and pushed and pulled from so many different angles. Uh, we have family responsibilities, we have work responsibilities, and then there's the push and the pull of social media. Uh, then there's, you know, the news feeding us all this stuff. And it feels like, well, where people do, I don't know whether people, I'm generalizing here, but I notice a lot of people seem to be highly strung and, and highly wound up 
and you know chronically, chronically yeah and yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. so what would be for those that are listening that find themselves in that state of i'm just overwhelmed the world's mm. so complex i don't know what to do um mm. i just i've just got to keep going there's so much to do mm. what would you suggest from what you what you do what you know would be mm. some some different different items or different things or tools that they could yep. use to bring themselves back to that re you know relax rejuvenating you know restorative yep. state so what are some tips here yeah awesome um monitor and measure what are we monitoring and what are we measuring um even if it's just resting heart rate when you wake up um, some people have wristwatches that already measure that um, some people go to the point of um measuring manually um, their heart rate every morning. Um, um, some people are getting buying rings, which are um, or, um, or, or aura rings, aura rings, right? Um, and they can tell us how, how well we slept and, um, and uh, but more to the point what our heart rate is when we wake up and our heart rate variability. So they're indications of our wellness. So we want to see heart rate when we, when we wake up lower and we want to see heart rate variability high when we wake up. Um, why are we doing this? Is because heart rate, uh, resting heart rate in the morning and heart rate variability are indicators of how stressed or tired or recovered you are. So if you track yourself for, for, for two weeks and you're always getting the same level of the same score um, and then you do have this really amazing retreat where you do massage and relax and you have saunas and cool, cold baths and eat great food and then you remeasure on Monday and your resting heart rate is lower and your heart rate variability is higher. It's an indication that, you've, that that's been a recovery you've actually gone away and sharpened the saw and your body is, um, is a better instrument. Mm -hmm. um, so I've kind of packaged a few things in there. Um, think day, daily practice where you seek to, throughout the day, um, usefully use breath to shift the state of your body. And by state, you're either alert, calm, or asleep. So which one do we want? Do we want to have that nap? In the afternoon, do we want to be calm and creative or do we want to be alert and, um, and then working hard? Although alert and calm are good to have at the same time. Um, by, by using our breath specifically, we can slow our breathing down and then our brain goes, oh, we must be safe. Well, we wouldn't be breathing like this if we weren't safe. So we're going to slow our breathing down like we did for my client, five breaths a minute, even something simple like that. And the brain will start to go, okay, yep, this is good. And five or 10 minutes of that is like just taking your saw and just getting a little bit of a sharp, a little bit of a, a little bit of a sharp. And then on a weekly basis, you're, you're aware of putting things into, into, into um, calendars where something, you'll do something bigger on a, on a, on once a week. Once a week, you might do a Kundalini yoga class or, or a Kundalini breath class or a meditation breath class or some kind of Wim Hof breathing once a week. Maybe once a month you might do a, a weekend or half day retreat where you do like some kind of Vistasana yoga uh, um, for breathing technique or you, you, might, um, you might come to the brain room, have a big, a big session um, once a month or what, once, once a season you might do um, a, a two day um, silent retreat where all you do is focus on your breath or you do some kind of Qigong movement. And then once a year um, you do something big something that's really going to just massively rejuvenate you, reset you, something that you love to do and you're eating great food and you're sleeping well and you're drinking well and you're getting sunlight and... You haven't got your phone with you. Yeah, you're doing amazing, awesome shit that you just forget about time and life. Life. And then you come back to it and your heart rate variability is the highest it's ever been. Your heart rate is the lowest it's ever been because you've recharged your battery. Yeah. You know, and most people are running around in chronic stress states with empty batteries. And what I'm here to say is that by using breath and other techniques such as infrared um, light um, stimulation, um, vagus nerve stimulation, which I'm taking online clients with, to teach them how to regulate their, their, their stress levels um, through stimulating the vagus nerve with some um, electrical um, stimulation devices, um, we can actually tune ourselves like you would go to ultra tune what's that like you know yeah so it's and tuning out the car take, and we don't do that yeah. now here's something that 
Here's something. Oh, we get that, massages, don't we? You do. I get massages. Yes. Monthly massages. Monthly I have. Mon yes, I have monthly massages, so I get a bit of body yeah. work and a bit of relaxation all in one. So Absolutely. one of the things I hear a lot of, and I see a lot of, is people people do a recovery, which means, oh, it's a Friday night. I'm going home. I'm going to put Netflix on and drink a bottle of wine. So how does that fit in with is is that from a scientific and a, a neurophysiology, I can't even say that word, a, a physical point of view, is that yeah. actually doing what we need it to do for recovery? Or is it having, you know, is there something better we could be doing than that? Or is that okay every now and then? What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think our, our mate um, Benny Wallington might um, be, um, have, have, have a few things to say about using alcohol to, um, to prime uh, flow states and get frothing. Um, for me, I think it depends on how badly that person really needs to change the channel and mm -hmm. how few options they have. Um, I'm working, uh, I've, I've worked with people who have limited options. They don't know that they can use breath or saunas or, um, or massage to change the channel, change how they feel. Because really we just want to change how we feel most of the time. Although some of us, we really need to change the channel in our head because there's too much stuff going on up in the head. So it's either stuff happening in the head that I don't like and it's just too busy and it's too frantic and it's too mean and it's too fast. Um, I'll switch or it up with a bottle of wine or a beer or yes, a vodka. Exactly. I'm going to change the channel on this motherfucker. Or I'm going to change the, um, switch on Netflix and, and, and be completely consumed in this, in this really rad alter, alter fiction. So it's seductive. It works. Um, if you do it long term, that's the question. If you do it every day, if you do it every week, if you do it every month, if you do it once a season, if you do it once a year, what is the risk reward? What's the payoff versus the downside? Um, I think it, um, straight up, alcohol will always impede sleep and impede deep sleep. And when we have the first half of our sleep is mainly deep sleep, which is when our brain actually sends fluid into the brain um, from the spinal fluid, cleans out our brain cells, it literally washes out all the dirty um, um, waste products from the brain cells because we have brains and they have cells and, and they create... They die products. off and need to be, yeah, that's the rubbish collection every night. Exactly. It's energy metabolism, biology 101, but it's happening in neurons. If we have that alcohol, we don't get as much deep sleep, therefore we don't get as much cleaning of the brain. So the next day we wonder why our heads feel horrible because there's a bunch of waste that should have got emptied, but because we had a drink, we are now... Um, we are left with half of yesterday's waste product. Yeah, and, and it's like another, yeah. it's like that feeling, you know, I know this is going to be a little bit, it's like that feeling, you know, when it's bin day and you forget to put the bins out. And you yep. go, Damn. Like so that's what's happening. Like within, yep. within us, there is this cycle that does this lovely clean out for us. And if we're not allowing that to happen and alcohol is gone, alcohol is you forgetting to put the bins out. And then the next yep. day you wake up feeling pretty crap because of it. Um, so That's I the think metaphor I normally use, Georgia. Yeah. I normally use that metaphor. So hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. I must have been tapped into you somehow, Rob. Um, and, and what happens after months and months and months of of of, of not doing it? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I, 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 it was like the, um, the the garbage strike in Italy. You know, um, eventually um, garbage was just piling up on the street, and there were rats and and flies and and animals and pests and, and, and diseases which shouldn't have been there and if you map that that metaphor across there is a chronic level of stress there's a chronic level of sleep deprivation and lack of deep sleep which is causing we could say mental illness yeah how about that there you go boom <laughs> so i want to I'm, I'm going to sort of just finish up and go cool. down a path of how can we a couple of Finishing up, I've probably got three questions to finish up with. So, you know, it's not going to be in two minutes. Well, maybe it will be. I just don't know, listeners. Um, so instead of the watching TV and the wine um, and instead of the getting angry with somebody, what are some just low-cost things we can do 
that potentially can help us shift that state and change the channel. It doesn't require a bottle of wine. It may not require coming to the brain room. Mm. What are one or two things we can do every day? Mm. Um, I think we definitely already covered breath. You know, breath yep. is you know, one of the quickest, easiest ones. Um, both of us have been exposed recently to Dr. Andrew Huberman from Stanford, um, yep. who talked about changing your, your, your gaze and the, the, the distance of your gaze. Um, and if you look off into the peripheral, sorry, if you open up your wide into like a panoramic, your vision into a panoramic view and you look off into the distance, if you can even do that, because if you're in an office, there's walls around you and there's no window, you can't actually put yourself off into the distance and just for a moment, give yourself a bit of space. That's why people go mad when they get put into small confined spaces because they can't feel like they've got, anyway. Um, so vision is, is, is another thing. Um, and look, in, in some ways, I'm going to jump in because there's something that I do that I think everyone can do that is um, have a go, see if it works for you. But just a simple walk in nature. So go to a local park, go and just sit and look at a tree and appreciate a tree. Um, don't take your phone, switch off and just go and be away from those things just go and have some time for yourself and we can all do that we can do that at work we can leave and you know australia or anywhere there's always a park you can go and sit in so go and spend a bit of time away from it and just people watch just do something a little different to walking is really good as well so just to recover actively instead of yeah. just plonking yourself on the couch turning yeah. on the remote and just you know, yes, it's okay, but I think if we do that too much, uh, I think we're we're missing out on actually fully recovering uh, that the the neural networks and the brain and having that, that the garbage truck coming and picking up all the garbage for us. So yeah. yeah. So talk to me about one thing you'd love or tell our listeners. What's one thing you'd love to leave them with from your experience? Now, I know you've got a wealth of knowledge and experience. So if you, were to, if you were to share one piece of advice or recommendation for something that's worked for you that you might like somebody to get curious about and see if it works for them, what would be a tip or a tool for people to, you know, be a little bit, better with their, their brain and their functioning of their brain because that's what you're passionate about. Um, yeah, lots of things come to mind. But what's worked for me, definitely been, been yeah, having some baselines that I could see improvement. If I've got scores, um, then I can see when there's improvement. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, for me, that's been if I was you know, seeking to change how I, how I looked and my, and, and my body shape, if I stand on a machine and it tells me how much muscle and fat I've got, and then I go back in three weeks or five weeks' time, and I've seen a dietitian, um, and I get on that scale and I go, "Wow, yeah, three kilos!" Woohoo! You know, that's the reinforcement, and and that encourages me to keep going. Like I'm on, I'm onto a good thing. Whereas if I um, if I get to that three weeks or five week retest and nothing's changed, I'm like, okay, hmm, I'm I'm either not playing the game at 100 percent. Um, the program's not working, there's something else going on which needs to be investigated. Um, and I think that's something that if you can monitor your uh, company. Yeah, so monitor point. and measure and get, get some evidence of, get of some what you're doing. For yourself. Yeah, yeah, okay, beautiful. And, and that's and, something and, everyone can do, right? Well, well yeah, yeah, we can, we can measure our heart rate in the morning. Uh, we can we, we can use fancy devices, or we can use, use our phone, put our finger up against the camera, and measure our heart rate variability. It takes two minutes every morning, and then we then we can start to see the the refractory period of life. Because mm. if we're normally at a, let's just say a, a random number, 60, 60 HRV, heart rate variability, and you're normally you know, 62, 58, 60, 61, 59, that's your normal ballpark, and then you go over to America and you spend time with the Flow Genome Project and you um, have amazing days and you travel the world for two weeks like I did recently and, um, and you track your heart rate and your heart rate variability and you, then you come back, what you see, what I saw was a massive drop, like 
everything. I went into depletion mode. I wasn't getting enough sleep. I was loving it. But if I had kept that up, I would have been, I would have been, and on the final night of our training, I was, I was rubbish. I tried to push. I had nothing in the tank because I'd gone from, I'd only had two hours, um, from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. that morning. Um, and I had an amazing night, but I dug into the next day. So when I tried to draw on something on that, uh, on that Saturday night, push in that final night that we were going to have together as a group, it wasn't there. Uh, I had spent my neurochemicals and I hadn't, or I'd spent them, but I hadn't helped to recharge them by having a really good sleep. Uh So um, by being able to triangulate these things and go, well, okay, that's what happened. And how am I feeling in myself? Um, What's happening to my performance? And then I'm triangulating that with, uh, or correlating that with some kind of biometric. Um, you can begin to learn how much, what helps me to bring myself, bring myself back up to an even keel, what knocked me for a week, how long can I keep this up until I start to get a cold, um, can, this, can, these, can this monitoring help me figure out when I'm about to get a cold um, or when I should pull back from physical training. Um, I think getting to know your body and your stress response and how hard you can push and, and how, how much recovery you actually need. Um, and it, it gives you something to test. Okay, I know I'm normally a, so bring back to the, to, to, to the Netflix and the wine. I know, I know every morning normally I've got a heart rate variability of 60 and my heart rate is normally 50. If I do that protocol, protocol, terrible word, if I do Netflix and drink the next night, uh, the next morning, what happens to my heart rate variability and what happens to my heart rate? I would suggest that it would probably be down. And if you did it in a daily, in a row, in a row, um, if you're even sleep, tracking your sleep, you could probably see the quality of sleep that you get. And then, so it's about getting to know yourself and what changes your levers. Um, and I love that. I love yeah. that. So yeah. there's some things there is around really that self-awareness, but not just self-awareness around your, your strengths and weaknesses, but self-awareness around your body now. So let's get really in tune with our body. And yep. your tip is, you know, where you can measure and record and see what's happening over time. So you're mm. becoming aware of the things that you're doing. Maybe it's the food, maybe it's the people you're around. What is it that's actually starting to cause you to go out of um, a state of calmness and relaxation now here's the thing life is life and we don't expect to be always on this calm line because that that, you know, that, that line of calmness actually is when we're dead right so we do Absolutely. want a little bit of up and down in it but we want to be able to bring mm. ourselves back to a state yeah. of homeostasis and feeling calm so we are ready to take the next leap mm. and, yeah. and if, if, I, if i can just say because i'm conscious you want to probably want to wrap up is that if we are getting into a like if we're already in a chronic state um, the only way is up with these metrics. Meaning, if you're already uh, a blunt act, um, you're probably not going. You, you may not drop any more, but the, but the way is up. But if if you're well and you start doing this, then um, and if you see your scores drop and drop and drop and drop over week, over week, over week, it's a sign that you're not doing enough recovery, right? And if you're going up and up and up and up and up. It means that your training is matching, your, your recovery is matching your training. And your training is hard enough to actually get your body to be more and more efficient, to, to be fitter and healthier. Heart, HIV is a, is a general gist for mood, wellness, fitness, emotional regulation, cognitive performance, memory. It's kind of like a really well-researched marker. So if, if it's dropping, you're not recovering enough. And if it's, uh, uh, or you're training too much. So it gives you, the reason I, I bring it up is because it gives you, it makes you focus on recovery and stress. And if you only focus on stress management, well, what does that mean? Get rid of all the stress in your life? No. It means add more recovery to balance the scale. Know how to and, recover. Uh, mm. Know how to fucking recover. Because when you wake up in the morning and you're on fire and you've had a great sleep and you've eaten well and you're, um, you're, you're unstoppable. You don't have to tell yourself you're unstoppable. You are unstoppable. I love you that. have had a four night sleep and you've had four hours sleep and your brain is, um, your monkey mind is going like crazy. Oh, you're a basket case. It doesn't matter how much you tell yourself you're unstoppable. It was, it, it was the state of your, 
the wellness of your body. Um, and this is for the people that, you know, that don't have you know, significant genetic yeah. and mental trauma issues. And I get that. But even for those people that do, this is even more important because those folks are probably more susceptible to stress. So they have to pay double, 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 double the amount of time and effort into recovery. Because yeah. But once they've done that effort, second. it will become second nature and they'll move away. They'll yes. be more inclined to have that and move away from that. that That's the theory. They'll move yeah. from mental illness to mental wellness. So, Rob, I want to thank you so much for thank taking you. the time out today to have a chat. We've gone down some really important rabbit holes for people to learn more about them themselves, their neuro neurobiology, um, how to recover better. So if people would like to get hold of you, what is the mm. best way? Where can they find you? Grab me. <laughs> I'm so, to came out and grab me and mm. pull me in a part. Um, the, um, I'm, I'm in Cairns in Queensland. So if you're in Cairns, you can find me. Um, you can find my, my digital presence on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram. Um, and is that can, under the brain room or Rob yeah, Grobnick? Yeah. Yep. Yep, yeah, under the brain room. And you can also find me, Rob Gronbeck, G R O N B E C K, um, 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 on Facebook and Instagram and uh, I mean, um, LinkedIn. And an email to info at thebrainroom.com.au is a way to reach me digitally and you'll show up on my radar. And, um, I'll do my best to... Um, yeah, any to, questions or any... So if there's anyone that's got a workplace that needs someone to come and have a talk about active recovery and stress reduction, I um, highly recommend that you get on to, uh, to Rob and get him down to give, do a talk, do a presentation, run one of his wonderful workshops. Um, and also if you're wanting some personal advice, hook him up for some of his coaching as well because you don't actually have to live in Cairns to be coached by him because you can do a lot of this stuff remotely nowadays so once again mm. thank you so much rob um it's been absolute pleasure and a delight talking with you and chatting with you and uncovering some of this information for our listeners and um yeah so hopefully we'll um, we may even get you back to talk about something else in the future so thank you so much thank you for coming down the robert hole <laughs> oh you're a classic thanks rob thanks georgia Thank you once again for dropping by and coming down a number of rabbit holes with me today with uh, Rob Grombeck. So Rob, as you can tell, is uber, super passionate about what he does. He has some great stories and he has a lot of expertise and authority and knowledge around, you know, what's happening on the inside of us from a from a neuro, neurobiology point of view. So, you know, get to know yourself, not just from a cognitive and intellectual space, but get to know your body more. And one of the things that I love about what he said today is learn to recover, learn to recover you know, gracefully, learn to recover in a way that is actually going to build you up and re-energize you and refuel your tank. And in this world we're living in at the moment, I don't think enough of us do that properly. I know for me of recent, um, I feel like I've been burning the candle at both ends. And um, what I'm going to do right now is before my next client, I'm getting on the floor and I'm just going to have a little bit of a yoga nidra which you might want to look into, which is just a nice seven minute relaxing meditation to re-energize me ready for the day. So thank you once again for dropping in. Please leave comments, um, like, subscribe, share if you've got some value from this or if you know someone who's pretty cool and rocking it out there in whatever they're doing, somebody extraordinary, let me know, send me an, uh, an email or a comment uh, at uh, support at bluechipminds.com and uh, we'll get on to that. So thank you so much for dropping by and remember, stay curious. Today is turning into the most curious adventure I've ever had.